Hi guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel. Welcome back to another true crime video here on my YouTube channel. If, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah. I have a YouTube channel, duh, and a podcast called Killer Instinct. It's a true crime podcast. All the links are in the description box below. I hope you are ready for a crazy case today. Um, and before we get started, we do have two sponsors. And the first sponsor that we have today is HelloFresh. If you guys have never heard of HelloFresh, HelloFresh is America's number one meal planning kit. HelloFresh lets you skip the stressful trips to the grocery store and the just staring in your fridge not knowing what you want to eat. Does anyone else relate to that? I feel like before HelloFresh, I did that constantly. HelloFresh offers countless recipes to choose from each week to help you break out of your recipe rut. There's something for everyone, including low calorie, vegetarian, and family friendly recipes every single week. HelloFresh offers fresh, high quality ingredients for a super flavorful experience. Over 90% of their ingredients are sourced directly from growers to ensure the freshest recipes are delivered to your door. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips so you can enjoy cooking and getting dinner on the table in just 30 minutes, sometimes even 20 minutes with their quick meal recipes. HelloFresh has made my life so much easier. I feel like life, even though we're still in lockdown, is so hectic and meal prepping as much as I want to do it, before HelloFresh, I just couldn't find the time to, and HelloFresh has made it so easy for me to time manage my life so much better. So if you guys want to check out HelloFresh, I'll have the link in the description box below. All you have to do is go to hellofresh.com slash killer80. Again, that's just hellofresh.com slash killer80, and you will get $80 off, including free shipping on your first HelloFresh box. So go check that out. And the second sponsor we have today is BetterHelp. If you've never heard of BetterHelp, BetterHelp is an online counseling service that allows you to get professional counseling in the comfort of your own home. Once you sign up with BetterHelp, we will take a survey which will then match you with a counselor that is deemed best to fit your needs and if at any point you decide you don't match with your counselor well you guys just don't vibe you will be able to change your counselor at no additional charge BetterHelp has counselors that specialize in countless different fields such as anxiety depression lgbtq plus matter relationships family trauma sleeping issues grief and much more so if you guys want to try out better help i will have that link in the description box below as well all you have to do is go to betterhelp.com slash instinct again that's just betterhelp.com slash instinct and you will get 10 percent off your first month using better help so i'll have both of the sponsors links in the description box below thank you to hellofresh and better help for sponsoring this video let's move on into the case so as you guys can tell by the title of today's video today we are talking about the murder of 33 year old michael shaver so this is michael shaver michael was born in january 1982 like I said, he was 33 years old at the time of his death. And at that time, he was living in a place called Lake County, Florida. Now, from what I could tell, Lake County is a pretty big area. It had a population of about 367 thousand people in 2019 and it's also pretty closely located to orlando florida now after michael graduated from school he went on to train to become a commercial pilot however in the midst of getting his pilot's license which he did end up doing he found another job that he really really loved and that was being a mechanic at disney world from what i could tell michael really enjoyed his job he enjoyed his co-workers a lot they all had a really good relationship and getting this job at Disney World is what really prompted his family to move to Central Florida. It's what prompted Michael, his wife, and his kids to move to Central Florida. Now, from what I can tell, Michael is described by the people that know him best as a very laid back guy. He was described as the type of guy that really just kept to himself. He stayed in his own lane. He liked to do handyman jobs around his house. He loved his family and he especially loved his kids. His kids were his world. He absolutely adored them. Once Michael got the job at Disney World, him and his family moved into a four bedroom, three bathroom home and the house stood on five acres. So they had a decent amount of land and for a while, things seemed to be going really well for his family. However, the year 2014 is when things took a very different turn. So let's talk about Michael's family. Let's dive into that a little bit. More specifically, Michael's wife. 
Now, Michael's wife is a woman named Lori Shaver. Now, Lori and Michael didn't have the most healthy relationship. Their relationship was described as toxic and tumultuous. There had been several domestic violence disputes between the two of them. Both of them had called the authorities on each other. So their relationship was not healthy. That's not the word to describe Michael and Lori's relationship. Several months before Michael's disappearance, Michael was said to have shown up to work with bruises all over his his face and neck and he disclosed to his co-workers that these bruises were a result of Lori. Lori and him had gotten into a fight. He said Lori got really mad at him and physically lashed out on him and that was where these bruises had come from. Police records also show that the two of them had a domestic violence dispute back in 2014 and it was said that Lori had hit Michael over the head with a gun. However, Michael was actually the one that ended up getting arrested for this because it was said that Michael was the one who pulled the gun on Lori to begin with and so Lori was just acting in self-defense so Michael ended up getting arrested for this. Lori in total had filed two domestic violence claims against Michael however she later dropped those charges and she also went through with getting a protective order against Michael however she dropped this after 11 days as well. There's also been allegations that Lori and Michael would have times of separation they wouldn't be together they would still live under the same house, but they wouldn't be together. They would just separate, but live in the same house. There've been allegations of them seeing other people and dating other people during these times of separation, but also living under the same roof while they're doing so for the sake of their kids, which as you can imagine, probably caused a lot of built up turmoil between the two of them as well. So let's talk about the last time Michael was ever seen. So the last time anyone saw Michael Shaver was on November 8th, 2015. Now on the the day prior to that, which was November 7th, a co-worker of Michael's named Frank Merritt said that him and Michael's family, so Michael and Lori and their kids and Frank, his wife and their kids had all gone to this show. It's called the Florida Flywheelers Tractor Show and it's in Fort Meade, Florida. So Michael was seen at this show and neighbors also said that they saw Michael that day. He was working out in his front yard. He was doing some handyman jobs out there. Everything seemed very, very normal. It seemed like an average day. However, at the Flywheeler show, Frank, Michael's co-worker, said that Michael and Lori ended up leaving the show early because they had gotten into an argument. Frank said he wasn't sure what really the argument was about, but whatever it was, it was enough of an argument to cause them to leave the show early. So that happened on November 7th, and then on November 8th, Michael was seen at work by his co-workers. His co-workers remember him being normal. Nothing seemed off nothing seemed out of the ordinary and after work him and some of the co-workers hung out in the parking lot of their job and after they hung around and talked for a little bit before he left Michael told his co-workers that he would see them on Tuesday so he got in his car and he drove away however that next shift never ended up happening now Michael was scheduled to work on November 10th so just two days later however he never showed up for his shift and two days prior to this on the 8th the last day that Michael was ever seen Scene, Frank, who is the co-worker that went to the flywheeler show with him, texted Michael and asked, you know, if everything was good, if everything was okay, because he had left the flywheeler show early and Frank said he just wanted to check in and make sure that Michael was good. However, when Frank texted Michael on the 8th, he never received a response, which Frank knew was very unlike Michael. Michael typically got back to everyone who ever reached out to him. So on the following day, the 9th, Frank reached out to Michael again and just double checked in, make sure everything was good. And that is when Frank got a very concerning text message back. Frank got a text message from Michael telling him that he quit his job, that he quit his job to save his marriage. And when Frank heard this, he thought that this made absolutely no sense. It was so out of the blue. Michael hadn't brought it up to any of them before. And he said that he would see everyone at his next shift. So it was very, very unexpected. Now, according to Michael's boss, Michael's boss received a text message from him which said that he was having problems with his family and that he needed to put his focus and his time into that to try and save his family. And so he told his boss to fire him or he will quit. Now, Michael's boss said that the tone of this text message was really unlike Michael. He was typically never that aggressive when he would talk to people. So to hear him say, just fire me or I'll quit was really off-putting and it raised some eyebrows for sure. When Michael's other 
other co-workers got word that Michael had quit, they all continued to text him as well. Everyone was just really thrown off by this news and that is when Michael texted everyone again and said, quote, I quit, don't contact me, you can keep my tools. End quote. Now, not only did Michael's co-workers never see him after this final interaction at work on November 8th, no one saw Michael ever again after November 8th. Not his neighbors, not his friends, not his family, and not his kids. So where did everyone think Michael went? Where was everyone under the impression that he had gone? Well, according to Michael's family and friends, they were told by Lori, his wife, that Michael moved away. He left his wife and he left his kids and he up and moved away to start a new life in Atlanta, Georgia. Now this didn't make sense to anyone who knew Michael because this just didn't match his character. He was not the type of guy that was going to up and leave his kids. But this is where this case gets kind of tricky and I'm going to try and explain it as best as I can because even though people knew that this was unlike Michael 100%, this didn't sound like him, he wouldn't be the type of person to do this, no one thought it was concerning enough to report him missing. So Michael actually didn't get reported missing for two and a half years after his disappearance. After November 8th, 2015, no one reported Michael missing for two and a half years years but there is reason for that which we're about to get into right now i'm turning you this way to switch up the lighting i know that's probably really confusing in the middle of the video i'm sorry but i think the lighting this way is a lot better right now because the sun is going down so part of the reason that no one thought that michael up and leaving town like Lori said was as concerning as it was this was because michael actually was active on social media not only that he was also texting people back when people reached out to him he would respond but even though he was responding and keeping up with his facebook statuses and photos on facebook it was the contents in his messages that he was sending back to people that were concerning you know when you're talking to someone everyone has their own texting style whether that's you use a lot of emojis you use no emojis you have good grammar you have bad grammar you put your entire message into one big message rather than cutting it up into sentences or maybe you cut it up into sentences instead of putting it into one big message. So everyone has a certain way that they text. And according to Michael's family and friends, that was one of the biggest red flags for them was the type of texting style that Michael seemed to have curated ever since he just disappeared from Florida. Family and friends also thought it was weird that when Michael would get reached out to, he would respond to people by telling them that he was fine, but just to never contact him again. Again, it was just another red flag because it just didn't seem like Michael's character. However, what Michael's family and friends were looking at were really the facts that they had, which was Lori, Michael's wife, telling them that Michael had left and Michael's still responding to text messages. He's still on Facebook. He's a 33 year old man, so he's an adult. And if he wants to up and leave, he is allowed to do so. So there wasn't much that his family and friends thought they could do at that point. Some of the other red flags though that did stand out were the fact that Michael's pilot license as well as his driver's license both expired during the times that he was supposedly in Georgia and he never renewed them. He also had a civil suit with a credit card that he failed to show up for. So those are just other examples of things that were happening in Michael's life that he wasn't showing up for. So Michael leaves in 2015, November 8th, 2015, and now we move on to 2016. Now, at some point in the early summer months of 2016, Lori ends up getting into a new relationship. She starts dating this guy named Travis Filmer. Now, Travis worked as a student life coordinator at a church called the Real Life Christian Church. Their relationship moved very, very quickly once it had started. And not only was their relationship moving fairly quickly, according to the people who knew Lori, they said that her behavior 
behavior also started to change a lot as well. Now, Travis worked for a church, right? So he was really into religion. And according to Lori's friends, she never really expressed any desire to be religious. She was not a religious person. However, once she started dating Travis, she completely dived into religion with him. There's actually a picture, I'm gonna pop it up right here that I found when doing my research of Lori and Travis holding hands together over a Bible. And I think Travis made this his profile picture on Facebook, if I have that right. I'll make a correction if I don't. But Lori was definitely changing her behavior once she met Travis. And not only that, she also exhibited other bizarre signs of behavior in terms of Michael. During this time, which mind you, was just a couple months after Michael disappeared or went off to start this new life, Lori started selling a lot of Michael's things because weirdly enough, even though Michael had gone off, like she said, to start this new life, he had left all of his belongings back in Lake County, Florida. All of his clothes, his car, his guns, everything of Michael's was left back in Florida, which is also a very big red flag that I'm not sure why no one really picked up on. Probably because no one was in that house other than Lori. But Lori began to sell a lot of Michael's things. So she sold his guns and his aircraft mechanic tools, and she also completely drained his bank account, as well as made fraudulent loan deposits in Michael's name. And Lori just reached a point where I think she either couldn't keep up with her own life or she was just getting caught up in all of it. And her story of what happened to Michael at this point when she started dating Travis, it varied based on who she was talking to. She told some people he moved to Atlanta and then she told other people he moved to New York. And then she told other people that he moved off to California. She told Travis's mom that Michael was a pilot and was traveling all the time. And that's why he was never home to see his kids. And she went as far as telling her supervisor that Michael was in jail for not paying child support. So everything in this just started to unravel. Now to make matters even weirder, and this might sound confusing, um, there really isn't a clarification as to why this happened at all. Just bear with me, I'm gonna try and explain it as best as I can, but when I read this, this is one of the eeriest parts of this case to me. So in September of 2015, which was just two months before Michael went off to start this new life, Lori was actually dating another man. Now, like I said in the beginning, Lori and Michael had taken times of separation where they would date other people. They could have had an open relationship for all we know. We don't really know the exact details of their relationship other than it just was toxic. So Lori was dating another man and this man had a wife. So not only was this man cheating on his wife, Lori was possibly cheating on Michael as well. And this man is not Travis. This is a different man than who Travis is. And in September of 2015, the man that Lori was dating's wife received flowers at her work with a little note on them. And I'm going to read you the note. It said, roses are red, violets are blue. My wife is a whore and your husband is too. Check your Facebook messages. We need to talk. Mike. Now, at first, obviously, this looks like Mike was sending these flowers to this man's wife. However, when authorities did a little bit of digging, they were able to figure out that Lori was actually the one who paid for the flowers. So Mike did not send these flowers to this person unless he went through Lori's bank account to do so. However, authorities do not believe that to be the case. They think that Lori was actually the one to send these flowers to this man's wife, which is just so strange. So now we move on to April 20th. 2016. So a couple months after Michael had gone off to start his new life and according to a friend of Michael's who's also named Michael, it kind of gets a little confusing. He had reached out to Michael just to check in. He wanted to see how he was doing, if everything was good, what the update was. And this is what he had to say about it because he said that the response that he got was very strange. He said, quote, I'll add, I got a message from Mike in April, 2016. He said, quote, I'm okay. Just don't feel like talking to anyone now. Dealing with a lot of shit right now. There isn't a lot Mike wouldn't talk to me about. That message is also a bit more aggressive than he usually ever was. Even when stressed, 
He was also funny on how sentences would flow, so the redundancy of the messages isn't like Mike's normal structure. This only came after pressing him hard to respond to me also, which isn't like him either, end quote. So that just goes to show, this is a friend of Michael who was saying that he's not an aggressive guy, this isn't his normal behavior, something seems off. So over time, everyone kind of started to pick up on what was going on. Everyone kind of started to realize that something was off. Off. However, the one person who seemed completely fine with everything was Lori. She was selling Michael's belongings. She was going off and starting a new relationship, which mind you, she never even got a divorce with Michael to begin with. So she was very unbothered. She seemed very unbothered, so unbothered that she ended up getting married to Travis without, again, any divorce papers being filed, which Travis said that he was told by Lori that there were divorce papers and that her and Michael were divorced and that the papers would just show up somewhere in the system, but they just never did. So Travis, and Lori got remarried in 2017 and shortly after that the two went on to have a child together. As far as Lori and Travis's wedding goes they got married in the backyard of Lori's home and I'm telling you that because that is going to be key here in a second. Then on November 14th 2017 Michael's Facebook was actually updated. He updated his cover photo on Facebook to a picture of a gun and he also posted a group of friends on his profile but mind you it wasn't him it wasn't like him and friends it was just a group of guys that he had posted at a bar so it just made it seem like he was out with these friends and he was just updating his profile to show that he was okay and out with friends now let's talk about the straw that broke the camel's back and what got authorities involved in this because you might be wondering if that was ever going to happen so one of michael's friends which is a man named scott amatu Show. I apologize if I'm butchering that. I probably am. Um, but he ended up getting in contact with Michael's sister. So Scott got in contact with Michael's sister and the two of them started talking about the fact that no one had physically seen Michael since 2015. So we're in the early months of 2018 and they're having this conversation about how no one has physically seen Michael and that it seems a little strange. And along with this, Michael had an ex-girlfriend. Now this is kind of confusing because I, it's never been clear why this happened. But there is an ex-girlfriend of Michael's that at this time was in contact with Scott and she went over to Lori's home. Now, mind you, when Travis and Lori got remarried, they did not move. So they stayed in the same house that Lori had lived in with Michael. So the ex-girlfriend goes over to the house and she notices that things are a little strange. She notices that all of Michael's personal belongings are there, including his wallet, and his cell phone. And being there, she put two and two together that why in the world would Michael's cell phone and wallet be at his house when he's not there? Years after he had already left. So when the ex-girlfriend left, she called Scott, Michael's friend. And she told Scott about what she had seen. And that is when Scott contacted the authorities and asked the authorities to go to Lori's home to do a welfare check. According to Scott, he said, I put all these little pieces together and nothing was right. That's what triggered me to call the authorities. Mike isn't the one to go and get up and leave his kids one day like she claimed. So authorities went over to the house on February 16th, 2018. And when the authorities got there, they were greeted by Lori. Lori was the one who answered the door. When answering the door, authorities said that Lori was very cooperative at first. She let them come inside. She kind of talked to them about what was going on. She answered their questions. She said that Michael had up and left her in 2015 and now it was 2018 and no one had seen him, but she didn't mind. She was living this new life with this man and everything was fine. She told authorities that Michael was supposed to come home from work one day and he just never did, but told her that he was leaving leaving her and their family and she just lived with it. There's a quote from authorities that said, quote, upon speaking to Lori for a few minutes, the conversation ended up making its way outside the home at which she stopped being cooperative and requested an attorney, end quote. So the initial conversation began in the inside of the home and then when authorities walked outside, Lori got a little hesitant. She stopped being as cooperative and when authorities asked if they could bring in cadaver dogs to search out the property, 
property, Lori said no. Now, because they couldn't continue to search without consent, they needed to get a warrant. Authorities did have to leave the property and they left the property, but they did end up getting a warrant and they came back to the house on March 9th, 2018. So they came back to Lori's property with cadaver dogs. And when they arrived on the property, the dogs immediately went to the back of the house and started sniffing out an area that was covered by a concrete slab. Now, the way that this was set up was there was a big concrete slab and then there was a fire pit on top of the slab. Now, according to a deputy in regards to the slab, he said, quote, upon walking up to the concrete slab, it was a three foot by six foot depression. The depression appeared to have a browning discoloration and resembled a shallow grave beneath the slab, end quote. And another detective went on to say, quote, it was not smooth at all. You can almost make out the shape of the body and the direction it was laying in end quote. Now, when Lori was asked about this concrete slab, she said that her and Travis had used it for a chicken coop. However, there were no chickens there. And then now they were going to dig it up and create a pond. That was their new thing that they were trying to do. However, they just hadn't gotten around to it yet. But no one was buying that story. No one bought this whole chicken coop pond story. So authorities decided to dig up the concrete slab. And when they did that, they discovered a human upper arm bone. And they did have anthropologists there on the scene that were able to help identify that the bones were in fact human remains. Now on March 10th, the following day, the search on Lori's property continued. And that is when the rest of the remains were discovered. Now it took months for these remains to be positively identified. However, on June 15th, 2018, the remains found in Lori's backyard in this concrete slab were positively matched to be Michael Shaver. So now police have cracked this case open. They have found Michael's remains on the property that he had shared with Lori, even though for the past two and a half years, Lori had been stating that she didn't know where Michael was and that he had gone off to start some new life and completely painted him out to be the bad guy. Meanwhile, he was in a concrete slab in her backyard the entire time. Now I want to talk about what just makes this case so incredibly twisted and that is the fact that I told you that Lori and Travis got married in Lori's backyard but not only did they just get married in Lori's backyard they got married on top of the concrete slab that Michael was buried in that is what they stood on during their ceremony and after their ceremony was finished they ended up carving their initials into the concrete slab that Michael was buried in. Now, when it comes to Travis, this is just where things get really strange because like I said earlier, Travis said that he was under the impression that Michael and Lori had gotten a divorce and that the divorce papers were somewhere in the court system and that they would be able to find them. Now, when Travis was asked about this whole situation, when authorities asked Travis about this whole situation, he told authorities that Lori had disclosed to him that there was a body buried on her property, but she didn't say who it was. He said that Lori told him that there was a body on her property, but he didn't know who it was. Lori didn't know who it was. There were really no questions asked after that. I am so curious to know what you think about that. I personally cannot fathom someone being told that there is a body buried on their property and then that's just the end of the conversation. Like nothing else gets said after that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like that makes no sense. Now, Travis also revealed another very interesting and very telling thing that Lori had told him in regards to Michael. Travis said when Lori and him were discussing Michael and their divorce, Lori looked at Travis and said in regards to Michael, quote, it's not that he's missing. He's no longer walking this earth end quote. And Travis just didn't ask any questions, which leads me to one of three things. It has to be one of these three things when it comes to Travis. Either one, he is stupid. Two, he was so blindly in love with Lori that he didn't care that there was a body buried on her property. 
didn't really ask any questions about it. And when she said that Michael was no longer walking this earth, it wasn't a concerning statement for him. Or three, Travis was somewhat involved in this. Now, Travis said that they met in the beginning of summer 2016. Michael was last seen in November of 2015. So if that's true, then there probably isn't any involvement on Travis's side other than just knowing more information than he was leading on. I think it's very possible that he fell in love with Lori. Lori told him the truth and he just didn't care. Now, crazy enough, even though Michael's body was discovered two years ago at this point, Lori was actually just arrested for this a couple weeks ago. She was arrested on September 17th, 2020 and charged with second degree murder an accessory after the fact to second degree homicide. And she is currently being held without any bond. Now, when it comes to cause of death and motive, neither of those have been released to the public yet. We do not know how Michael died. Authorities probably do know, and it most likely will come out during the trial. However, it has not been released to the public yet. And as far as Lori's stance on all of this, she claims her innocence. She says that she had nothing to do with this. She has no idea what happened, but what she did say is that Michael had a lot of enemies and that a lot of people didn't like him and that it's very possible that one of these enemies could have done this to Michael and tried to frame her for it. I think it's very possible that Lori will either say that she had nothing to do with this or that it was self-defense. With the history of their relationship having domestic violence in it, I would not be surprised if she claimed self-defense on this. So I am so interested. This case gets me going. It gives me so much adrenaline just because, and I'm sure you could tell throughout this video, I'm very hyped up on this case because it blows my mind. The fact that Lori and Travis, regardless of Travis's involvement, stood on the slab that Michael was buried in when they got married. It's just like spitting on someone's grave. Like it is the terrible, terrible, terrible. And then to not only do that, but to then carve your initials into where he is buried. I wanna know if you guys think, like, where do you think Travis falls in all of this? And as far as the social media posts go, cause I don't think I clarified that, authorities are under the impression that it was basically Lori being Michael this entire time. So Lori was the one behind the texts. Lori was the one behind the Facebook updates, the cover photo updates and the Facebook messenger. It was Lori this entire time. So that is extremely just creepy and weird. So let me know what you guys think about this case. I am definitely going to be following this one very, very closely. So let me know what you think in the comments below. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another true crime episode here on my YouTube channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah. I make videos three days a week, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. You should subscribe and join the family. I love you guys so much. And I'll be back in a couple days with a brand new one. Bye guys.